Okay, well, uh, again, I want to add my welcome to you if you don't know me. My name's David. Now, and I just want to ask you, um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go right to, this, to, the, to what we're talking about today. We're, we're, I'm going to be preaching about Jesus the Healer from the book of Luke. And over the month of February, we've been, every Sunday, taking a different gospel and perhaps bring a slightly different emphasis. And so what, let's find out what we know about Luke's gospel. What do we know about Luke? Shout out one thing that you know about Luke. Doctors got it. And who, how, who's a doctor here today? We've had a few doctors. There's a few doctors there. All right, this sermon, I dedicate this sermon to you, all right? A few GPs. And, and so, um, so, we've got, so Luke's a doctor. What, what else do we know about him? His, and a historian. Okay, so... When we read the Gospel of Luke and his sequel, which is the book of Acts, what we find is that that Luke undertook to make an orderly account of all that he knew, that was known and being shared about Jesus. So he writes to someone called Theophilus, which could be a person or it could represent everybody who loves God, because that's what Theophilus means. But he, he writes to give an orderly account of the stories about Jesus so that we could know and understand and believe. Uh, and, and learn as well. well. Anything else we know about um, Luke? He massive children. Two things. Travel with Paul and, women and he notices women and children a lot. Okay, so there's some interesting things. He, he, I mean, Jesus noticed women and children a lot, didn't he? And, and, and Luke, as he records um, the, the acts of Jesus and also the Acts of Apostles, notes the interactions with women and children. We'll see one of those today. And he was a traveling companion of Paul. Absolutely right. And so, um, as Paul is such an influence in the New Testament, and we see that Pauline stream, we see, if you like, in the Gospels, Luke representing almost a Pauline stream in his own thinking, theology, and what he records. So, I think that, Paul is, uh, that, that Luke is interested in a whole range of things. I, I think he's interested in the work of the Spirit. And quite often, Luke draws our attention to the work of the Holy Spirit in the miracles and work of Jesus. And he also is, is, is interested, as a doctor perhaps, in healing. And we're going to look at, at how Luke tells us about Jesus the healer. And um, I just want to ask you a question. How many people here have been healed? Oh, that's quite a lot of hands up, actually. Uh, anybody here ever in some way been sick at any point in their life? <laughs> I think most of you have been sick at some point as well. Now, the reality is God is a healing God. The things that we make do not get well. I mean, I've got a car. At the moment, it's making a noise which is unhealthy. I've prayed for it. I've anointed it with oil. <laughs> it's not getting well. The stuff that, that we make doesn't get well. But all of us have got healing in us because God is a healing God. And healing is actually in the fabric of the, of the universe. And so thank God you know, that when we get sick, we also do get better. You know, you, 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 it may have just been a cold, but it's unpleasant and you got better. And, and thanks God for that. But from time to time, as well as the healing that God has put in the creation that he's made, he acts in supernatural power to heal. And those, when, when God acts in supernatural power to heal, what we see is we see a picture of the coming full, complete reign of God that we know will be if we believe the Bible. If we believe what it says at the end of, uh, of human history as we know it, in the new age of the new heavens and the earth, there'll be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, no more tears. We, we believe that that's there in, 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 in God's goodness. And we, we want to see that now. Right now, we see, as Paul puts it, a, a creation groaning, as in the pains of childbirth. Something's good there. We have to deposit the Spirit, but we don't, we don't yet have it all. We live in a tension between the now, where there's a, a world that's shot through with suffering as well as healing, and the not yet, where there will be a restored creation. And in that tension, we want to get as much of the future into the present. We want to get as much of the kingdom of God that is to come into the now of our experience. And when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're praying. We're praying, can some of the future come into today? Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, actually, give us today the bread of tomorrow. Give us today some of our future blessing right now. But um, when we think about Luke, Luke, when he's recording Peter's sermon, 
in the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 10. Peter has visited the house of a Gentile uh, um, and a, a centurion, and, and, and he's there to tell him about Jesus. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 10. This is the reputation that Jesus has. He says, you, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling them the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what's happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So in other words, where, when Peter is trying to give some contact to this Gentile about what God was up to and talks about Jesus, you've heard the reputation of Jesus. You know, you're not Jewish, you're not local to Galilee, but you've heard the reputation. Here's somebody who had a reputation for healing. That was the reputation of Jesus, a healer, an exorcist, someone who drove out demons, who healed the sick. And when we look at the New Testament, we find about a quarter of it is, is concerned with, uh, the, the, the Gospels rather, about a quarter of the Gospels are concerned with healing. And we often find Jesus on his way to heal someone, or on his way back from healing someone, or discussion talking about what happened because of healing, or the activity of healing. And in Luke's Gospel, in, in Luke chapter 8, what we see actually is a flow of miracles that together represent the range of the things that Jesus did. So in Luke 8, we have the healing of a, of a demonized man. Jesus crosses a lake, has an encounter with a man who is profoundly demonized. He's right at the extreme. He's somebody who is living in the tombs, who, who goes around naked, who cuts himself, who's got supernatural strength, who's both a fearful character, but someone who's very vulnerable, marginalized, and alone. And Jesus... When this man comes and falls at his feet, Jesus sets him free from powers that are too strong for him. Then he goes back across the lake, and when he gets to the other side, he encounters someone called Jairus. Jairus is a very different social sphere to the demonized man. The demonized man is an outcast from society. Jairus is described as the synagogue ruler, someone with status and authority and position. But he, like the demonized man, falls at Jesus' feet. Come and help me, my daughter is sick, will you come? So Jesus sets off. On the way, he encounters a woman. Well, she, she, she creeps up on him, basically, and she has an issue of physical healing. She has been bleeding for 12 years. She touches Jesus, power leaves him, she is healed. And the, the, there's, a, there's some dialogue around that. And while that's happening, Jairus' daughter has died. And Jesus continues to Jairus' house and raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. So in the space of a chapter, you have, the, 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 if you like, Jesus' greatest hits. You know, I mean, Luke's not recording everything that Jesus does, but he records in this little flow of episodes something that kind of sums up something of the healing and deliverance ministry of Jesus, a profound deliverance, a physical healing, and a raising of someone from the dead. So we're actually going to turn to uh, Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to read from verse 40. And you can see the words as they come up on the screen, I expect. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. And then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came, fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She spent all she had on doctors, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing she couldn't go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. And in the presence of all the people, she told him why she touched him and how she'd been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And today I'm just going to pick out things from the passage and the subsequent verses. Um, and, and so rather than a kind of three-point sermon, there'll be just some stuff from, from this passage. And I think the first thing I want to reference is that we're all 
at a level place at the feet of Jesus. The demonized man falls at the feet of Jesus. He's got a need, and only Jesus can meet it. Jairus, at the opposite end of the social spectrum, falls at the feet of Jesus. He's got a need. And the woman, actually, it says, um, she came trembling and fell at his feet. And she had a need that only Jesus could meet. All of us in this room, we find a commonality at the, as we kneel at the feet of Jesus. We need him. We're all united in the fact that, that in life and in death, we need Jesus. And whenever we pray here on a Sunday, we're going to be praying when we have communion, we're all able to come to Jesus and get help. Whatever your background, whatever your social status, we're level. We're all people standing in the need of the grace of God. Anyway, so um, Jairus falls at Jesus' feet, come to my house. And as he's on his way, there's a lot of expectation, crowds around him, jostling him. And yet Jesus stops and says, look, someone touched me. And the disciples' response is, what do you mean someone touched you? Everyone's touching you. You're in a crowd. But Jesus said, no, someone touched me. Something happens in this episode where someone touches Jesus with faith. Jesus is not like a, um, a kind of divine Van de Graaff generator. You know, have you ever done that at school? Everybody touches the Van de Graaff generator and your hair stands on end? I don't know if you've done that experiment. It wasn't like that everybody who touched Jesus said, oh, there's power coming from him. But there's something about faith that seems to earth the power of God. And with all the people who are touching Jesus, one person touched him with faith. This woman, and we can see from the other gospel accounts, that she'd kind of thought to herself, mm, if I just touch him, if I just touch the edge of his garment, I just need a little bit, I'll be healed. It's great, isn't it? A little bit of Jesus goes a long way. There's another woman, actually, who, who said to Jesus when he was, uh, she was asking for prayer, and he said, it's not right to give the bread to the dogs. She said, even... It's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. She said, even the dogs gather up the crumbs under the table. A crumb of Jesus is enough for a healing to happen. A touch of the hem of his garment is enough for healing to happen. If the presence of Jesus is here today, then for us our faith is small like a mustard seed. But he's here. Anything can happen. So she touches Jesus with faith. And the power of God flows through him to her. And that is one of the things that we, we see about healing, actually, that healing is normatively and often, it doesn't have to be like that. It wasn't always like that with Jesus. But commonly, Jesus touched people, or people asked him to lay their hands on him and to, to bless them or to heal them. And the laying on of hands, that ministry where we touch people and ask for the power of God to flow to them, is part of how we pray for the sick. Now, power flows in the material world. It seems to flow in the spiritual world too. And I don't know how many of you here have ever felt a sensation of power when someone has laid hands on you. Has, any, has that happened to anyone? Okay, so if you look around, there's a whole bunch of people where they've experienced something like that phenomenon today. And so, just impress, as we pray for the sick, we very often lay hands on people. You don't need to have, it doesn't need to be on, on the part, you know, if someone's got breast cancer, that's not where you need to lay your hand. Just the hem of the garment will do. But there's something about touch and the flow of power, which is, um, seems to be a constant phenomena. And, and as we want to learn to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we do, we, we do that. Now, now, Jesus actually calls the woman out. There's something about the woman. She's afraid. It says she came trembling. There are some very good reasons for that. For someone in the culture of the New Testament world, and someone from uh, the, the Jewish culture of that time, uh, bleeding makes you ceremonially unclean. Your job is to not touch people. So the fact that she's touched someone, she, she's actually been doing something which she should not do, and she knows that she should not do it. I've just made the rabbi unclean. You know, it's like someone with coronavirus coming to church and shake hands with people at the end of the service. I should not do that. I should be in isolation because I'm unclean. And, um, and, and that's, that's what she's been taught. And so for her, actually, as well as having physical illness and suffering, having spent all the money on doctors, doctors, don't be offended by that. That's why we have the NHS. It's a wonderful thing. But um, she's actually been a social outcast for 12 years, too. And there's something about sickness which goes beyond the physical very often, doesn't it? It affects our whole 
emotional and social well-being. It certainly did for her. And I wonder when Jesus called her out, he knows there's been a touch of faith. And as he establishes the story, he does more than heal her. He affirms her and reinstates her into the society that she's been alienated from. He calls her daughter. It's beautiful tenderness from Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is tender with people who come vulnerable to him. If you come trembling to Jesus today and you say, oh, I'm not really sure I should be here. I'm not really sure I belong. I'm not really sure I'm worthy. If you look at my track record, I feel a bit unclean. Jesus says to you, son, daughter. And he, he loves to welcome people. And, and he says to her, <laughs> when, he, when she tells the story, he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Jesus seems to like it when people push in and ask him for stuff. And he doesn't say, I healed you. He says, your faith has made you well. It's, it's an endorsement. Now, if you're British, you can sometimes get a bit irritated with people who are a bit pushy. Do you, do you find that? Those people push the way to the front of a queue. Those people who want that. I get a bit like, you know, I, I like to sort of wait to be noticed and to be invited up for something. But Jesus seemed to like people who were pushy about getting what they needed from him. He commends people who were assertive about asking him for things. And people who, who were pushy with Jesus seemed to get blessed. The, the, the guys who made a hole in the roof, it would irritate me if people made a hole in my roof. <laughs> but Jesus seemed to, to see it as a sign of faith. Blind Bartimaeus, who's there at the side of the road, shouting out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And every said, Stop being so pushy, shut up. He's a teacher. He said, bring him out. Jesus likes it when we try and get hold of the good stuff from him. And, and, and maybe that's just a little lesson for us. Let's not be shy or backwards or over modest. Let's be a bit pushy about asking God to bless us. It's okay to do that. And he affirms her and says, your faith has healed you. The word in Greek is sozo. It's more than a healing. It's about a wholeness. Your faith has made you whole. Go back. But of course, while this has been happening, while all this distraction has been going on, Jairus' daughter has died. And so messages come to Jairus. Oh, don't bother the teacher. I'll read the next bit. While Jesus was still speaking, someone from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, came. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. It's not the most pastorally sensitive thing, is it? You know, don't bother the teacher. Anyway, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he didn't let anyone go in with him, except Peter, John, and James, the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said, she's not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. And her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Sometimes the data of our experience is nothing can happen here. For the woman who'd been bleeding, she'd had 12 years. She'd been living with discouragement for a long time. It's hard. If you're sick here today and you've been sick for a long time, you're probably fed up of people praying for you. You probably think, please don't pray for me because I don't want to be disappointed again. Please don't pray for me, it hasn't worked. Maybe that, that was a woman's experience. Maybe for, for Jairus, it's just heart saying, it's too late, it's not going to happen now. But, but I wonder whether there's, uh, the data of the word of Jesus to us is different. And Jesus speaks into that situation and says, don't be afraid. Just believe and she'll be healed. Someone that we, we know and love in this congregation is, is Ruth Bartlett. And, um, and she's somebody like uh, the woman who, who had a long-term issue. She had muscular dystrophy for 10 years. Muscular dystrophy doesn't respond to remission. Ruth's a doctor. Her husband's a doctor. She was not getting well. She had, a, had to have a stair lift in her house. She had to not lift her children. She couldn't lift her children. She couldn't do the outdoor things that she enjoyed, going up mountains. And... She'd had loads of prayer, was fed up with it. It's not happening. Please don't do it. One day her grandmother said, please will you take this blessed handkerchief? A bit superstitious, a blessed handkerchief, isn't it? But she took it to please her grandmother. Her grandmother had faith. Three months later, Ruth's completely well. 
Stella's taken out of her house. She's lifted a kid. She's, and this is some while ago. She's part of our congregation. We know that she's still well. And, and that defies a normal medical outcome and explanation. Faith, earth, the power of God. Even if it's your grandmother's faith with a, with a handkerchief. And um, so the woman had faith. How much faith did Jairus' daughter have at this point? When you're dead, you don't have faith. Faith is a mysterious thing, isn't it? But as I said, faith earths the power of God. There are two things that seem to earth the power of God as we look at the gospel stories, faith and love. Sometimes Jesus, moved by compassion, does things. Sometimes Jesus responds to the faith of people and does things. But those two things are very powerful in seeing the power of God respond. And so he arrives at the home of Jairus and, and he, he, he comes expecting God to do something. What he finds is cynicism. What he finds is mockery. They laughed at him when he said, she's not dead but asleep. And and what he does is he gets rid of the cynical atmosphere. He just sends them all out of the house. And he brings in people with some faith. He brings in... um, Actually, yeah, he, he brings it with Peter, John, and James. And just bear in mind that Peter, John, and James have just been with Jesus on a mission trip. They've just seen the gathering demoniac brought into his right mind. They've just seen a woman healed on the street. They're up for it. <laughs> this is Jesus we're with. Anything could happen. They're up for it. And mum and dad, they have a vested interest. They, they don't want to believe there's no hope left for their daughter. Everyone else goes. And a culture of faith replaces a culture of cynicism and unbelief. Now, if it's true that faith earths the power of God, it does seem that unbelief can hinder it. And we we know, again, that Jesus at Nazareth did no mighty deeds because of their unbelief. They just knew him really well. They they were, you know, oh, we know him. He's a carpenter's son. We know his family. We're not expecting much from him. A prophet is not without honour, save in his own country, Jesus said. But I wonder sometimes what, what, what culture we have here. In Bristol, in, in the West, do we have a culture of faith, a culture of unbelief? It's, it can be hard to have a culture of faith. It's amazing how faith can sometimes grow, telling stories. Um, last week, we, we went away, so not two weeks ago, uh, our staff team went for an overnighter. We went down to Sidmouth. We stayed in a guest house. And it's just all the staff from the Woodlands Group of Churches, about 50 of us there, and we had a guy with us called Mark Aldridge. He's a vicar, and he's a Bristolian, and um, he heads up New Wine International, and um, he just is into healing, actually. He was wimberized as a young man, like I was. And, um, and, and we just got a chance to pray for one another. And one of, the, one of the people who got prayer was Deb Marsh. And she's married to Ed, you know, and, and she's had for two years neurological pain and muscular pain in her shoulder on medication every day. She got prayer. The neurological pain went. She stopped taking her medication. I was at Highgrove a week later. There's Deb on the stage moving her shoulder. Look what happened to me. No medication this week, and I'm pain-free. Nettie was there, and, and Nettie had had a bleed behind her eye, and for 10 weeks she, she had not been able to see out of her left eye. She couldn't use her mobile phone. She couldn't read text. And um, there was a, a big clot. She's going to have it um, extracted by a syringe, pulling bits of it out over two hours, which is quite unpleasant because you're awake while that happens. And um, she got some prayer. Frankly, our faith levels weren't that high, you know. But... Um, she got back home, and in the night she woke up, and she looked at her uh, mobile phone, and she was reading the text. She hadn't been able to do that for 10 weeks. She couldn't drive. She, got, she, she actually drove. Now, actually, when she went to, to her appointment the following Thursday, they, said, they, they looked at her and said, 60% of the clot has dispersed. And so her two-hour operation turned into 40 minutes, and um, she was very grateful. And I get not a complete healing but something of of God doing something. And and there's something for us in that gathering. A sense of faith had come to us. And partly it was hearing some great stories from someone that we trusted and who was very real about it. And actually sharing stories, sharing testimony increases our faith. But there was definitely faith there. And, And I guess the reality is throughout the history of our, of our life together as a church, we have seen healing. But we've also seen not healing. We've seen people get well, we've seen people die. And, 
And we, sometimes we can be more tuned into the bad news than the good news. And I understand that. And we, we're not answering all the theological problems that healing brings, because it does. But we are saying, are we expecting the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who's been poured out by Jesus on the church, who's present with us, the Lordship of the risen Lord Jesus, that anything can happen. When we have communion, I often say, he is risen. That means his spirit's here, which means anything can happen. Could it happen today? I think it could. So we want to have that culture of faith, not that culture of cynicism. What do we do about raising of the dead, by the way? I, I think that Jesus healed everybody who asked him. We don't see any account in the New Testament of Jesus not healing somebody who asked him. It's not that everyone around Jesus always got healed, actually. But on the whole, when, when, you know, what, what's consistent is when people ask Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? They, 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 get, they get well. We, we, raising the dead is a rarity in the ministry of Jesus. There are three accounts in the New Testament. They're all young, premature deaths. There is Jairus' daughter here, there's the widow of Nain's son, and there's Lazarus. And um, interesting to, to reflect on those things. Would I pray for someone to be raised from the dead? It would not be by default unless I had a word from the Lord. If Jesus said to me, and someone's died, don't be afraid, just believe, she'll be healed, I would go and pray for someone. But unless I heard from the word from the Lord, probably I wouldn't do that, you know? I, I'd, I'd need to feel there's something miraculous here because this is beyond the ordinary. This is death working backwards, and th those are special occasions, and there's a special occasion here. Second of all, raising from the dead destabilizes the world that we're in because it is the future breaking into the now in an ex such an extraordinary way that it destabilizes the powers of darkness and it kicks off a reaction. Later on, Jesus is going to raise someone from the dead. That's Lazarus. And what happens is it precipitates the climax of his whole ministry. And he goes to the cross because Caiaphas says, he's too powerful, we've got to stop him. And I don't know whether that's a demonic voice behind Caiaphas. But whatever it, or, you know, whatever it is, it's the climax of, of uh, it, it's a, the final confrontation with the powers of death. And it leads to the cross. And you'll notice here, Jesus has raised her from some of the dead and says, don't tell anyone what has happened. Why is that? We sometimes talk about the messianic secret, where Jesus actually hasn't finished his time on, on planet Earth with his disciples and, and doesn't want to kind of... Um, precipitate the climax before he's got time to really build with his disciples. And so here's something huge that's happened, so therefore don't tell people, rather than what's often says, let's, let's give some testimony, it's going to raise some faith. Anyway, those are my speculative thoughts about raising from the dead. But this is where I'm going to come into land. Here's the interesting thing. We've just read three extraordinary stories about Jesus. He's healed a demonized person, he's healed a sick woman, He's raised a child from the dead, and he's done it with great tenderness. It's lovely, isn't it? Just like he's tender with, with um, the woman. He's tender with the child. Daughter, get up. And um, also, he's so practical. She needs something to eat. She needs some nurture. She needs some space. Let's not a big fuss around. Let's tell loads of people. Let's just nurture her right now. Jesus is like that. He's wise, isn't he? He's not into sensational. He's into blessing. And he blesses this family in ways that they could not have imagined. And then he gives it over to us. The next verse in chapter 9. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. How extraordinary, isn't it? After all that, that that should now be what we're commissioned to do too, as they were commissioned to do that. And I don't know whether you believe that that, that is your call and commission. The disciples took it seriously. If you go over to the book of Acts and you see them doing the things that Jesus did, 
healing sick people, paralyzed people walking, Peter going to raise a dead woman. And it feels just like the account we've read here. You know, he gets the mourners out of the room, he prays, Tabitha, get up. It's interesting, in this passage, how much praying does Jesus do? Didn't pray for the woman who touched him, but power flowed from him. He didn't pray for the sick girl, he's just like, little girl, get up. If God's at work, if the Father's at work, if the king is happening, if God said it's going to happen, we just speak in words of authority, words of command. It's just fascinating stuff, isn't it? But this is Jesus who we love. This is Jesus that we stand in the line of that commission to the church, those 12. We stand in that line. And honestly, if you talk to people in this church, if you talk to people on the team, we have seen God heal. And we don't want to stop praying for people who are sick. We don't want the data of our experience, the data of what's not happened, to stop us looking for what's yet to happen. We don't want the not yet to stop the now in our midst. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to have communion together. And one of the practices that we have at Woodlands is that we, we love to see communion as a place where the future breaks into the now because this is a future meal. There's going to be a great banquet in the kingdom of heaven, a wedding feast. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be there. And we've got quite a few tribes, tongues, and nations here today, actually, haven't we? We've got Botswana and Jamaica and all over the place. And, and, and we're here as the people of God, and it's, it's a foretaste of the future. So wouldn't it be so appropriate to have a foretaste of no more sickness, no more pain, no more death? Not sure what we're going to do on the no more death bit, but certainly it'd be great to pray, wouldn't it, for people who are sick today. So what, this is what we, we do this week after week when we have communion, but we're going to ask you today, if you have a need for prayer, if you have any need at all in life, but particularly if you have a need for healing, then when you come for, for communion, just tell the person that you're give, give, is giving you communion. And we'd love to lay hands on you and pray for you. We'll probably have a few extra kind of healing prayer people around here. But we want to pray today for, for anyone who's sick. And we want to ask God to give us gifts of faith to reach out for what we don't yet see. So I'm going to pray for those things and then I'm going to lead us into communion. Father, I want to thank you that your power is present now because where two or three gather in your name, you're there in the midst of them. And we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, by your spirit. We welcome your presence here in this room now. We welcome the good news of the kingdom of God, that God is for us. And if God is for us, who could be against us? We welcome the Lord Jesus Christ who went around doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil because God was with him. And we thank you, God, that you're with us. We welcome you here. And I pray today, God, you'd pour out your spirit. And as we pray for people and lay hands on them, if there are needs for healing today, that people would be healed in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.